Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here with my friend and second-time podcast visitor, Fiona Flight. We had her on uh, back in maybe two years ago, uh, talking about YouTube, which is also one of her specializations. But today, we're going to talk about some really interesting current event kinds of subjects uh, that are about what's going on in Hollywood right now, streaming and residuals and AI and how that all affects musicians. So uh, before we jump in, maybe just give them the the short version of your personal music story, like you know how you got started in music, what you do in music now, and how that relates to kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be back on the podcast my name, as you said, Fiona, and I have a background as a classically trained opera singer. I was a opera singer and musical theater singer for many, many years. I've released an album as a classical singer and as a singing teacher. And all that time, I was making my living in music, but struggling the way you may be, the way that most artists do. And I started to feel quite frustrated seeing my own students who were so talented and so ready to have great professional careers struggling as well, particularly to make money and to just have reliable income and sort of lives that felt comfortable. But I kept trying. I kept putting myself out there. I kept going to all of the auditions until I booked seriously a dream job. Everything about it, it just seemed like, yes, this is it. I was singing for 2000 people. We were getting standing ovations, completely sold out. And I was, I was not a minor character in this production. I had a, a, a significant role and I looked around one day and I'm on stage and I'm seeing, you know, 2000 people and I've just sung this, you know, heart wrenching aria, well, a song. And I think I'm making minimum wage for this. Here I am at at like the, the peak of my career and like this opportunity, I'm making it as an artist, but I'm, I'm making so little, I make, I'm making it, but it is so little. (laughs) And that was a real turning point for me. And it was right before the pandemic. And at that point, I just decided, you know, something's got to change. And I poured all of myself into studying social media and online business and how I could make that work for me as an artist and how I could help other artists to also leverage social media in a very strategic way to make money that would make them then truly independent, right? We're all indie artists and yet we're completely dependent upon these gatekeepers for our livelihoods. And I wanted us to become actually independent, financially independent, creatively autonomous. And that's where the profitable performer revolution was born. Love it. Love it. And and another good point is like, you're on that stage and all those people are like loving what you're doing, but do they really know who you are? You know what I mean? Like you don't have that individual connection, like an artist who's building their own brand has. 150 million percent. Yes. <laughs> okay. So you've got a lot of experience kind of in the musical theater, like acting, that kind of world. And, you know, we were talking the other day and you were saying like, I'm just really passionate about talking about what's going on in Hollywood right now and how it actually also affects musicians. There are many musicians that do both, you know, they act and they sing, or maybe they work on shows um, and they sing and they perform. Um, So, you know, that would really affect them, but then also in ways that the way this is playing out 
is kind of showing what goes on with musicians as well. So we want to dive into all of that. So first of all, just make sure that everybody really knows what's going on in Hollywood right now and why should they care? Absolutely. And I think that part of what we have to also emphasize is that precedents are being set right mm -hmm. now in terms of the kind of contracts that come out, what is negotiated, precedents and legal boundaries are being set that are going to absolutely impact across the entertainment industries, but also just in cross across all of the industries, because everything is being affected by what we're about to talk about. So right now in Hollywood, the Writers Guild is on strike. They were on strike for quite a bit of time. And following the Writers Guild strike, which is still continuing as of this recording, the SAG-AFTRA union has also striked. So SAG-AFTRA is the union of film and television actors. So they're, they're on strike and all of Hollywood is shut down. So when the writers shut down that halted all new production when the actors joined them that halted all production mm. and one of the things that people have been saying i i'm so obsessed with this topic right now and i read the comments and i think this is really important for musicians as well it's important for performing artists across the board is that in the comments that i read of like somebody says you know, I'm in support of these striking actors and writers in Hollywood. And it's not just Hollywood, it's people in this union across the country. People in the comments will say, well, I don't care about those people already making millions of dollars. Who cares about them? They're making so much. Oh, the poor actor wants another million dollars. That's not who this strike is for. No. And it's exactly the same thing that happens with musicians where it's like, if you, people think you're a success, if you, if people think you're a successful musician, then they think you're making money like somebody on a, on a huge tour would be making, but you and I know that you're probably not, you're a working class musician. And it's the same in Hollywood. We have all of these working class actors who are just trying to make a good middle-class income. And that possibility is, is being stripped from them. And so one of the things that I think is really fascinating is the way in which I, even here in Los Angeles, knowing so much as I did, am seeing what these people who are on hit TV shows as writers and as actors are, are dealing with. And they are dealing with the exact same gig economy that all of the musicians are. So whereas at one point you could be a writer or an actor on a hit show and you had a contract for 20 plus episodes for the year and you made enough money to qualify for healthcare in your union and you made enough money to, to live okay. And that money was secured. But now with streaming, the seasons have been truncated and to... Eight, eight episodes, for example, when you think about your favorite shows on Netflix, how are they 20 episodes per season? No, they're not. They're, they're much shorter. And that has impacted their ability to make enough money to qualify for healthcare. And so when we look at this big picture, we're talking about working class people who are wanting to make a just livable wage the same as music, musicians are. And whereas we thought that a job in Hollywood was protected, it's it's not. It's exactly the same as what we are struggling with. So you see somebody at an awards event, some, some actor who's not a huge name, but you know them from your favorite show. And that person, this is what's coming out in their social media during the strikes. This person, there's a, there's a literal example, for example, had to borrow money from his mom to pay for his suit. Ugh. put his bow tie on a credit card. He was on a hit show accepting an award for that show. And this is this is what we're doing. This is what we're living with. And so this massive income gap between the the CEOs, the people at the higher levels of corporate who are runner, running everything, whether we're talking about a record label or we're talking about Hollywood, that gap between them and the artists who are actually producing the product is just widening and widening and widening, even the people that we think of as being successful. Yeah. And it's just, there's so many things that are similar to what musicians go through for sure. And so what are they trying to negotiate with these strikes? 
that you know why are they why are they even in this position to begin with and I, I do feel like this is very similar to what's gone on with musicians and trying to get more money from streaming and things like that I I believe exactly the same things that is being negotiated so of course there is can we please increase payment to match inflation could could mm. we even bring it anywhere close to what's, I mean, right now with inflation, you go to the grocery store, I go to buy dog food and every week it's like a dollar or two more oh. for dog food. <laughs> and I even, I, I spoke to the, to the person who, one of the people that was on staff there. And I said, this, this seems a lot more expensive. And she literally said to me every week, we are increasing the the prices where we get it from corporate and we increase the prices. This is what inflation is looking like for me in Los Angeles. So like, could we even increase it just a, a, a tiny bit? Could we increase the, you know, to the payments to, to match inflation? But the other two things that are a hundred percent in alignment with what is happening for musicians as well, things that musicians need to be aware of and concerned about. And I don't believe that enough musicians are paying attention to this is the well okay you are absolutely paying attention to this issue of streaming <laughs> but the ai issue so we'll start with residuals so residuals in hollywood are basically your royalties as a musician or or what you get from streaming and the thing is that the way it used to work for tv actors is that when a like a show like friends was sold in um syndication Every time an episode was played, those actors received a payment, like you might receive royalties when your albums are sold. And that was great. It meant that if you were on a hit TV show, then you basically, if you if you planned well, you had enough money for retirement. Uh, and that is what happened for all of those actors on Friends, assuming they managed their money well. Now there was this new media contract at the beginning of the streaming era, which basically was to support people like me who wanted to create YouTube videos with my friends. <laughs> but it's not me who was using the, oh, well, yes, I, I, I might use it, but who's using it now? Netflix, Amazon, Disney, Hulu, massive tech companies are have found this loophole with the new media contracts so that they are paying literal pennies for streaming and there's no transparency around how how well any particular show on any particular network on any particular streaming site is doing so you don't even know you know by word of mouth that emily in paris for example is doing really well or stranger things but you don't know you don't have any numbers and you're not getting any kind of payment beyond pennies beyond what you were originally paid and so this is this is abhorrent and it's and and it's again it's it's made it impossible to earn a living as an actor in hollywood and it's like what we all know is happening with Spotify or any of those platforms where you where you're getting so fractions of pennies for for all of your effort and then but they're getting their subscriptions and they're getting new users who are who would, and they couldn't exist the streaming platforms couldn't exist without you and your art. Yeah, very similar to Spotify in that way. Are are they having to report to the unions how many streams are happening in order to pay those pennies? Because wouldn't they still have to show in some way? So I know that this is one of the primary things that is being fought over transparency in this area. I believe there is a, a, a little bit of, of sharing around this, but nowhere near what is, is necessary hmm. of information. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And so, okay. So is, is there any more you want to talk about residuals and stuff before we go into the, the big AI question? Cause that is a, that's a big one. So I just, I just wanted to, to share that that is, is one of the things the residuals and to make this comparison for all of you musicians about what is happening here in Hollywood and how similar it is to what is happening for you with streaming with your own albums, but no, let's jump into AI because what they want around AI is consent 
and compensation. So the offer that was made, one of the offers that was made that was rejected by the union, by SAG-AFTRA, one of the offers that the AMPTP, that's the negotiating body for the producers, put forth was we would like to pay your background actors. So background actors are the people who don't have lines and they're they're there in the background. And right now it's contracted that a production needs to hire a certain number of background actors. And one of the things that I believe is important to understand is that being a background actor is one of the ways you get into the union. Brad Mm. Pitt got into the union that way. I got into the union that way. So you book three SAG union background jobs and you can get into the union. Well, they would like to pay the background actor for one day of work, scan them into the computer and use that scan in perpetuity. Okay. I was, I was, I'm glad you're explaining this because I was trying to figure out how in the world can AI work with actors? Oh my God. (laughs) So interesting. (laughs) Well, let's, let's get into that. So now we have a background actor scanned into the computer with all of their movements in perpetuity. There is now literally no reason to ever hire a background actor again. With enough of those background actors scanned, they can, I mean, if you if you even look at any of what's happening with the, the AI on Instagram, there are AI sort of producers or small tech companies where, uh, or small platforms where they show you, I, I just watched one, it was horrifying to me the other day where they took a, a woman and she is just there smiling and sort of moves her head and they have, um, the, you know, the screen sort of cuts half of their face and they become another race. Oh. And then it it smooths it out. So now they're fully the other race. Oh. And now it goes back again. And now they're another race. So we're not even talking about changing skin tone, skin color, skin uh or or hair length or hair style. We're talking about changing the the complete essence of the person. If there's not a ethical problem in this. I I don't know what there is. So as I was saying, you take enough background actors, it wouldn't take very many, you scan them all. And now you just populate the scenes with them wherever you want them, doing whatever you want them to do. So we've now obliterated an entire industry, an entire job sector within Hollywood, all of the 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 background actors, which is way a lot of actors who are trying to make it earn money, but it, and then a lot of actors join the union, but there is more ethical consideration. So Brad Pitt, for example, this is how he entered the union. Well, what happens if the next Brad Pitt does this, becomes famous, and his likeness is owned in perpetuity by that whoever you know got his his background or consent or, or scanned him originally in perpetuity. Now they can use him for absolutely anything that he wants without his consent. So so there's that. And then we also completely wipe out all of the supportive job sectors related to background actors. So as someone who's done background acting, I can tell you that means whoever sets up the tent to protect us from the sun, that's gone. The, The food service, that's gone. The parking, uh, area and the person that monitors the parking, that's gone. The person that do- runs the shuttle to and from parking, that's gone. The person mm-hmm. that manages payroll for the background actors, that's gone. So we're we're just wiping out income for all of these working class people. I mean, these are definitely things that those of us that haven't been in the industry, I, I didn't even think about this iteration of AI, which is really interesting. So at this point, like, do they still, like, will it ever get to the point where we don't even need real actors to do the speaking parts? 100%. These are the background people, right? So Yes, 100%. Wow. Right now, if you are a a star, you have some kind of legal, potential legal challenge that you could make. But uh, 100% already, they have the capability of taking your voice and using it any way that they want. Uh, if you just if you just think about okay, right now you can put in you know 
write something down and have the computer speak it for you, they absolutely can take pretty much any voice that has been scanned in wow. and, and use it however they want. If you see, for example, all of the deep fake stuff, there's that deep fake Tom Cruise guy. And this is the, the technology is there. You can see it. It's absolutely convincing a lot of the time in his videos that he's Tom Cruise. Wow. So all of this already exists. And the only thing that's stopping them from being used already in, in greater in, a, in, in, in the movies themselves is the fact that they could be sued because there's, there's not the legal things. And that's why I said at the beginning that precedents are being set here. Mm -hmm. So if you go from here, you know, th this question around usage, if you think about that Drake song, right? The heart on my sleeve song. So this was an AI generated song that sounded just like Drake. And so it, it this is going to affect everybody across all industries. So do you think that, because I've heard some people say like Pandora's box has already been opened, like there's no going back. And if they would have done these negotiations a few years earlier, if they could have like seen the future of AI, but now like it's just too far beyond where they can reel it back in. Do you think that might be the case? So yes and no. <laughs> so yes, it there's no stopping this. This is this is the future. This is technology. This is where everything is headed. It, mm -hmm. There there's no stopping the trajectory of AI. That would be like going back and stopping the internet. Right. It, this is just and and we don't want to because we we want to ride the wave of technology and of expanding the world, expanding the universe, right? Expanding what's possible. So there's that. But is it too late to, to put in governmental restrictions? It, no. Is there too late to set legal boundaries around consent? No, it's not too late for that. That's, that's the whole point. Are there also always going to be, uh, you know, dishonest, crooked, thieves out there. Uh, for example, you may or may not have heard about having a safe word in your family because one of the scams that's going around now is having an AI generated voice that sounds just like your child or other family member calling you and telling you that they're in trouble. Wow. And you need to then be able to differentiate how do you tell if your kid is actually safe in their college dorm room or even he even at home with you in their bedroom or are they actually in trouble and so there are people parents talk about or you know parent educators talk about having a safe word for those situations uh just knowing that that is a possibility it's like this this voice copying thing can happen at, at any level uh just regular people and so of course it can be stealing your music and your your singing and your acting and all, you know, it can steal your voice, whether you're a non-famous person or a celebrity. Yep. Wow. That's interesting about the parenting thing. I hadn't heard that yet, but I haven't, honestly, I have been burying my head in the sand a bit <laughs> around AI because I'm just like, oh, I can't wrap my head around this and it sounds very scary and all of that stuff. Um, but So what, on the musician side, what do we need to know about this? How, what do we need to be looking out for to protect ourselves and just to understand like where the industry is going to go with this? Yeah, I think that there's, you know, absolutely silver linings in all of this as well. I think it matters that you become educated. I think is is really important that you understand what's going on and that you start to make choices for yourself. So there are ethical considerations to consider and there are self-protective things to consider. One of the things that that is a bright light for me is that while it is 100% possible to completely reproduce or create a new perf uh, filmed performance of someone and have it really look like that person and and seem to be that person. I mean, you look at uh, Carrie Fisher in the the last Star mm -hmm. Wars movie, or you look at the way in which they made Harrison Ford younger in the most recent Temple of uh, the most re recent Indiana Jones movie. This this also is the same technology that we're talking about. 
so so it, it's been here uh even just the person speaking on ways right i don't know if you have the oh, yes. you uh -huh. know ways and you can choose to have some celebrity's voice right did you ever realize well if i can have the celebrity voicing my ways that's ai they could be voicing anything but they're not there in the car with you live right you don't have that celebrity sitting next to you in your car seat live doing your directions and so that is a bright spot for me in terms of live performance there there's not going to be a way to yet <laughs> at some point perhaps we will have humanoid robots who look totally like people we're not there yet <laughs> so where we're at where we're at right now is that there's there's nothing nothing like a live person, the live energy there on stage as a musician. I do want to have a caveat to that because my teenager introduced me a while ago to this quote, vocaloid, Hatsune Miku. Have you heard of her? No. <laughs> okay. Well, she's really famous and she's a hologram that performs to live audiences. Wow. Uh, she was well, I was originally... thinking about the, the ABBA tour, the hologram tour too. Yeah. So this exists, right? Yes. So, so there are uh, voice sampled singers uh, singing software that could become live performers or are already live performers, but that's not going to replace the experience of you going to a, a show and experiencing your favorite person live. Now, why is that person your favorite person? And this gets into what I help people, what I help performing artists with. That is your favorite person because you have a relationship with that person, probably over social media. You have come to really connect with them and identify with them and they've built their audience and their personal brand and you really believe that they are a, a person. Humans want to connect with other people. And so if you build your audience, then they will want to connect with you and, and show up for you at your live events. That is not replaceable by, a, by AI. So that's one thing. Another bright spot, I believe, for those of you who are musicians who also have some kind of teaching or coaching business is that, you know, I did for a long time. I performed as a singer live and I taught singing lessons. There's nothing that can replace the human connection of having a one-to-one -one singing lesson and or any kind of music lesson. And so while there is there are, you know, there are AI therapists, there are, I'm going to be AI teachers, you know, piano teachers and drum teachers and whatever. This is similar to learning off of a YouTube video, but there's going to be interactive. I think there may already be interactive therapy via AI or else that's on the way. I think it, it sounds really crazy and maybe it'll be cheaper to do it that way. But nothing can complace the space that you as a human hold for your student. And so even if that does become an option, there's always going to be human people who want to connect <laughs> in a lesson space with other human people. So I think that, that those two things are, are great knowings for, for musicians. But in, in order for you to, to benefit from that, you, you need to be building your audience yourself so that you can, you know, get the people to your shows and continue to have that relationship, whether you're, you're performing or you're, or you're teaching. So that's part of, that's one half of what I think um, musicians want to do. And I'll, I'll see if you want to cut in before I go into the other half. Yeah. I mean, it all comes down to relationship for sure. And maybe someday people will say, well, we can have a relationship with an AI, you know, yeah. but it's, yeah. it's still the different. movies do that. Right. <laughs> right. Right. That's true. But I think it's really going to benefit indie artists, especially like just like the organic performing experience. You know, you may still go, there may be like still holograms performing in big, you know, arenas and stuff like that, but there's nothing that can replace that experience of like seeing your favorite indie artists in like a coffee shop or a house concert or something where you can almost touch them. And just, you know, the fact that no performance is the same every time if it's a real person. And so the performance that you get in that experience is 
like your own, like no, no one else other than the people in that room experienced that performance. 100%. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I think that's definitely, that's a bright spot and something that I think indie artists can lean into. Yes. Okay. So dive into the other, your other part of (laughs) the AI thing. So the other half of the AI thing is how do you, as a musician, want to use it? Do you want to embrace it? Do you want to, you know, ignore it completely? I, I think that ignoring it completely is, you know, maybe in your own ethics and your own morality, you simply cannot go near the AI, but I do think that it's a little bit short-sighted. I think we need to understand the technology and ideally we can can benefit from it as well. So on a large, and we're gonna get into some of the ethical concerns. So on a large scale, at a label, for example, and this is exactly like what we're talking about in Hollywood, You've got a lot of people working to put out an album, right? You've got the music producer, you've got the graphic designer, the album cover, the marketing, the promotion. You've got people in all of these different parts that go to promoting and, you know, creating and putting out the album. Well, this AI can be used to, like with the issue in Hollywood, wipe out certain sectors. Mm -hmm. So now, for example, you could have one tech producer who knows all the software, who could create the album artwork, who could create the backing, uh, the backing tracks, the uh, instruments, the instrumentation, You, you could have one sort of, just one person who's savvy in as a as an overall music producer or album producer who's basically doing all of the jobs now mm-hmm. even even to the music even to generating the songs themselves because you can put into the ai you can say i want a song that sounds like this and this and i want it to be really moody and soulful and it needs to have a lot of rhymes and it should talk about aging and get a song is that song gonna suck though? I mean, that's that's where I well, don't this is this time. is where we go back to the Drake uh Heart on Your Sleeve song. Uh-huh. It it no, it's not gonna suck. It's it's just gonna be where it is at this stage of development in the tech. Later on, the more that gets fed into the AI software, the better it's gonna get. Mm-hmm. See, AI is 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 iterative, and so it can only I, I think I'm using that word correctly. It yep. can it can only um, use what it has been fed. Right. So it's going to be repeating what it has already been fed, but part, of, but that is art true also, right? We as artists, we're always, yes, we want to take all the credit for our creations, but we've been influenced by all the people that we've been influenced by. And so you could create something entirely new by saying, I want a song that sounds like for me, I want to make in, in musical theater, I want this the singer's voice to be a mixture of Audra McDonald and and Patty Lapone. You know, what would that sound like? You know, or I want, I want uh I want a mixture of the Beatles and of a uh, Prince. You know, like you're gonna get something totally different when you when you mash up right? These things that could, could be entirely new. And so, yeah, this is, this is what we're, what we're dealing with. So this is like the real world version of what people put in their bios. Like my sound is like, if this person, this person had a baby. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's uh, what it is. And so we can, that that's already exists. And I think that there's massive ethical concerns, but as a independent artist, is it is it wrong for you if you're already doing your own album artwork to benefit from AI's ability to augment what you might be able to create on your own? Well, and that's and- where with indie artists, I think it would actually help indie artists exactly make money. Right. Exactly. That side. Whereas the label, it's cutting out all these sectors of jobs, but for the indie artists, it's bringing it down to a level we can afford. Exactly. And so this is, this is why I think it's really important that yes, you do start to embrace the parts of AI that you can in fact use to support yourself as an indie artist. And so there's graphic design is like an immediate 
you know, mm-hmm. yes, like that, I, just using Canva myself right now, I use it all the time. There's so many things in there that are being driven by the, by the technology or using Lightroom, just anything, all your Instagram posts, you know, your social media, you can start using AI to help you with that. Now, there is a concern for me. I have yet to u- try to generate captions, for example, using chat GPT. I know a lot of people are doing it. I don't know that I want to give the computer. I don't know that I want to feed in all of my, you know, cause I'm a very good writer and I don't know that I want to give it all of my writing even to benefit myself because mm. there is not legal constraints and boundaries. Yeah, it right doesn't now. just, just hold to you. Then exactly you put it in there. Then somebody else's caption might suddenly look like yours. Yeah. And mm. I, and I don't know, I haven't done enough research research yet on all of this and and it, there's nothing this is the other thing is that there's nothing stopping someone from saying you know what i love the way fiona writes her captions i'm going to feed it a bunch of fiona's captions ah. i want to sound like a mashup between fiona and tony robbins <laughs> <laughs> so can we pull this back in the box no we can't pull it back but can we start to build in some kind of consent, some kind of legal parameters, what is okay and what's not. And somebody who's talking a lot about AI is as particularly about AI in film is Justine Bateman. So if anyone's interested in what's going on with AI in film, I recommend looking up Justine Bateman. She's pretty active right now on Instagram. One of the things that she says that I that I really like, because she's she's like, this AI thing is an absolute monster. It's horrific. I can't stand it. And on the other side, this is about the Pandora's box. So yes, Mm. we've opened Pandora's box. It exists. It's no going back. We can't box it back up. But one of the things that she says is that the, and, and is that there's going to be a post-apocalypse. I'm using my own words, but she's, she says there's a bright side at at the end of this using my own words. It's like the post-apocalypse, there's going to be a rebirth, a rebirth of, of that desire for the true human connection. I had a client who described it as the pendulum swinging both ways, right? Like right now we're going all the way into the AI, but there's going to be a reverse swing of the pendulum where it's like, you know, everything is fake. And I, I really want to see what's real now. Yeah. But that goes back to what I said about how organic performances are going to be so much more valuable. I really, really, truly believe that. Yeah. And I think, I think the pendulum is, I remember when I first came into the industry really uh, and started, you know, my academy and and stuff like that in 2015, I felt like that era was all about like, I don't need to perform live. I can just sell my music online. And, you know, that was even when people were still selling music online, you know, and I can just have, I can just sit in my basement and make music and, and, and develop all my fans online. I never have to go to the, out of the house. And I was always like so against that because I feel like one big part of being a musician is who you are on stage and just that connection with your audience that you can't get any other way. And I'm sure there, yeah, there's people that can do that other thing and they can be successful. But I know for me, that would never work. And the people that I like to work with, like that just wouldn't fulfill them. And so I was always pushing back, you know, on that whole thing. And I think where the pendulum is swinging here and it's being accelerated by this AI revolution. Exactly. Yeah. But on the other side, like you said, this small, that, that just connection that you feel the electricity that you Mm -hmm. feel throughout your body as a human being in a room with other humans dancing and listen, you know, hearing your artist, feeling the, the beat in your body in harmony with all the other people all of the other human beings like that there's nothing we human beings want and need connection and community with other human beings so there no i do not believe that that where we're at now (laughs) for the foreseeable future i definitely believe we're going to swing back to that and that right now there's a craving for it as well yeah, I think, you know, with the pandemic and all that, there was already a turn back to I want those live experiences. And I think the AI is just going to push it even more 
in that direction. That doesn't mean there's not going to be those people out there that are literally online making an income through AI yeah. music. There will be, oh. right? Yeah. Yeah. Which reminds me that the there is also job opportunity here for any music producers out there, music producers who are listening, who are like, I love the AI. I want to embrace it all the way. Well, right now is your time. Mm. I would encourage those people to embrace it all the way. And then that you have got some really great pathways to income and jobs, either independently or working for a larger producer. Mm. Yeah, that's good to take note of. So is there anything we haven't covered in this conversation? Because I want to make sure that we cover all the important points and oh. that, that everybody's really educated on this as much as possible, or where can they go to get more educated? Well, I, I do think that Justine Bateman is a good person to follow on, on Instagram for a high level on, on all of this. Um, I, I think we should talk about the ethical considerations. Okay. So there's, you know, you know, just, just touch on them because it's like, you know, especially those of you who are going to fully embrace it. And I'm not, I'm not saying don't embrace it. I'm just saying, embrace it with your eyes open about where, where's the line that you're going to draw. So there's issues of copyright, obviously. I mean, this, this is huge. And one of the things that Justine Bateman talks about is why aren't the studios already in terms of Hollywood, why aren't they saying, uh, you can't use our films because Films are being produced now, completely AI driven, that have been clearly sampling film, copyrighted films, mm. copyrighted performances. And the studios to, to this point have not come out and said, you can't use our, our stuff in your films. And her concern is that that's because this is exactly what they want to be doing themselves. So there's massive concerns around copyright and how you can protect yourself as a as a copyright holder, as a I musician. See. They don't want to come out against it because that yeah. would shut them down in doing what they want to move forward in doing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And these are, you have to understand that these are uh, studios that were, would go after uh, somebody in their living room, a single person in their living room who is bootlegging a a couple movies to sell right so they'll go after you for bootlegging but they're not going after these ai produced film like there's there's a disconnect going on that's that's one of her um her points but for yourself you you need to be paying attention to this copyright issue and whether or not your own stuff is being used so that's a that's a an ethical consideration and also for you if you do use the ai in creating your own music how are you sampling what how are you getting your your input and is it copyright proved Mm -hmm. um there was an article recently in a uh it's called corporate direct.com and for anyone who wants to follow up on this it's the article was ai may be infringing on your copyrights so all of you who hold copyrights for your music that might be an article to read just to start thinking about or being aware of how how two sides of this, protecting your own copyright and not getting in trouble because there are not currently legal boundaries, but you could, you could make an AI, um, you know, a sort of uh, hybrid uh, as a music producer or as a musician, you could create a hybrid new song that goes viral of some kind of mashup of your own stuff with something from the AI and then later have a copyright infringement slapped on you because the laws are not in place yet. Right. And so that's a that's a real danger. Um, so there's that. Be aware when we're looking at the AI stuff for your album art and for what you're using on Instagram, just for the visuals that this thing about standard of beauty, I, I saw again, like this was a, another article that I saw it had nothing to do with um it had nothing to do with standards of beauty it was talking about how can i use one platform mid journey how can i get a prompt for mid journey from chat gpt it was just about what prompts should i be using to generate my ai and the prompt was something about i want a um a beautiful young woman with red hair in nature and the ai was producing a traditionally white Mm. aesthetic red-haired beauty Mm -hmm. 
And it was like, when I saw those images, I was thinking, what is this going to do to young people growing up who are just beginning to, you know, see what they want to see in the mirror or aren't feeling good about themselves. And the AI is now determining our standards of beauty when like, because it had a very clear standard of what beauty was and it was very traditional aesthetic. And it's just what it's been fed. So if we feed yes. it more, you know, versions of beauty. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. And then appropriation the, in that same article it said, produce this, you know, very culturally specific piece of art. Mm. And it immediately pushed out this art that looked, you know, like this other culture entirely. I, I don't think we should have that <laughs> power in our capability that feels like appropriation. I'm very uncomfortable with it. Wow. Um, and then of course, putting whole, whole job sectors out of work. So those are some of the ethical considerations. I'm not saying that to you know, put um, any kind of dark cloud over your use of AI. I just think we want to go into it with our eyes open and being aware of what it, what what are the ethics and what is our own moral compass and where can we play? Where's the room? Like for me, I'm okay using filters when I show up on, on Instagram, you know, of myself, uh, if it makes me feel more confident and, and I'm okay with, editing in Lightroom beyond my skills because the AI is like doing it for me. I don't have to learn how to use Photoshop. So it's where, where's your ethical moral compass in terms of your own use of, of AI? That's, that's just it. It's like being aware that there are these things to think about. Yeah, no, it's good to kind of do a gut check with yourself as you go into it, right? Exactly. And, and instead of just kind of like, la 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 you know what I mean I don't want to know yeah or I don't want to think about it right is there is there any way like any I mean since we've got all these technologies right is there any technology now that can help you search to see if somebody's using your own music in their own AI I do not know mm. I think it's a really important question I and think that uh, come up with that <laughs> That article, yeah, someone needs to come up with it. And that article would be a place to start. Um, maybe you can link it in the show notes. Interesting. You know, it's kind of like you Google yourself or whatever, you know, finding where you are, where your stuff is online. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But because it, you know, it's like how much of it gets copied, you know, it's, it's right. so interesting, complex. Yep. And when it's mishmashed in with it, other mm -hmm. stuff, like, could it even recognize that it was yours anymore? And if it doesn't, then maybe it's okay. Right. But if it, if it does, like, if it's clearly a copy, like the heart on your sleeve, then it's like, not okay at all. Right. Interesting. Wow. This has been quite a mind bender <laughs> in, in my side anyway, you know, just thinking about all these things. And like I said, I have and I will admit that I have not, you know, been like, I need to immediately get someone on here to talk about AI because I'm just like, oh, just the whole thing makes my head spin. But I do know that it is very important um, to, to for us all to know about. And when you mentioned having this conversation, I was like, I can't imagine anyone better to have this conversation because of the fact that you do care about the ethics of it and that you do your research. So thank you for for everything that you've you've told us today. Can you let everybody know how they can find you online and uh, follow you on social media and, and all of that stuff and, and where they can find out about the profitable performer? Absolutely. So my handles everywhere are just Fiona Flight, F-I-O-N-A Flight, F-L-Y-T-E. And I am very, very active pretty much daily on Instagram, uh, on Facebook. And on Facebook, I have a free group for performing artists who want to become profitable, who are artistpreneurs, or at least want to 
lean or begin to lean in that direction of becoming artistpreneurs, people who want to grow your social media following, leverage social media to make money, grow your online business. And that is the Profitable Performer with Fiona Flight. You can probably just search Profitable Performer on Facebook and you'll find me, uh, you'll find that group. So that con that group has got free content daily. Then also my YouTube channel, and there's so much value there. Also free, that is Fiona Flight. I talk about all things mindset, marketing, and monetization for musicians, for performing artists there. Then I have absolutely ways that you can pay to work with me and we can dive deep together. And this is my great joy and my passion. I have got a just amazing program called Real Magic, which is like such a, a, a cool way to enter with me. It's quite inexpensive. Just message me about that. Uh, and it teaches you everything about reels as a performing artist, how to literally perform, uh, promote yourself. And in there is a masterclass called Reels Rockstar, which is specifically all about self-promotion as a musician, as an artist. And then I also have got a bigger year long program called the Profitable Performer Revolution. This is where I help you build your business for an entire year. Just message me about any of it. Wow. So much cool stuff. And she does, she provides so much value on Instagram. I always run across your reels all the time. So, and they're, and they're so good. They're always like, so thought provoking. And then it makes you, and she writes like amazing captions. So don't skip the captions. So thank you so much, Fiona. It's been great to have you back on the show. And um, I like look forward to us being able to finally meet again in person again. It's been over a year and it's fun that you're in LA. So hopefully we can do that again soon. Absolutely. I can't wait. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.